Chapter 13, The Bottle of Wine As week followed week, it started to become clear to Bruno that he would not be going home to Berlin in the foreseeable future, and that he could forget about sliding down banisters and his comfortable home, or seeing Carl or Daniel or Martin anytime soon. However, with each day that passed, he began to get used to being it out with, and stopped feeling quite so unhappy about his new life. After all, it wasn't as if he had nobody to talk to anymore. Every afternoon when classes were finished, Bruno took the long walk along the fence and sat and talked with his new friend Schmull until it was time to come home. And that had started to make up for all the times he had missed Berlin. One afternoon, as he was filling his pockets with some bread and cheese from the kitchen fridge to take with him, Maria came in and stopped when she saw what he was doing. Hello, said Bruno, trying to appear as casual as possible. You gave me a fright. I didn't hear you coming. You're not eating again, surely, asked Maria with a smile. You had lunch, didn't you? And you're still hungry? A little, said Bruno. I'm going for a walk, and I thought I might get peckish on the way. Maria shrugged her shoulders and went over to the cooker, where she put a pan of water on to boil. Laid out on the surface beside it was a pile of potatoes and carrots, ready for peeling when Pavel arrived later in the afternoon. Bruno was about to leave when the food caught his eye, and a question came into his mind that had been bothering him for some time. He hadn't been able to think of anyone to ask before, but this seemed like the perfect moment and the perfect person. Maria, he said, can I ask you a question? The maid turned round and looked at him in surprise. Of course, Master Bruno, she said. And if I ask you this question, will you promise not to tell anyone that I asked it? She narrowed her eyes suspiciously, but nodded. All right, she said. What is it you want to know? It's about Pavel, said Bruno. You know him, don't you? The man who comes and peels the veg vegetables and then waits on us at the table. Oh, yes, said Maria with a smile. She sounded relieved that his question wasn't going to be about anything more serious. I know, Pavel. We've spoken on many occasions. Why do you ask about him? Well, said Bruno, choosing his words carefully in case he said something he shouldn't. Do you remember soon after we got here when I made the swing on the oak tree and fell and cut my knee? Yes, said Maria. It's not hurting you again, is it? No, it's not that, said Bruno. But when I heard it, Pavel was the only grown-up around, and he brought me in here and cleaned it and washed it and put the green ointment on it, which stung, but I suppose it made it better, and then he put a bandage on it. That's what anyone would do if someone's hurt, said Maria. I know, he continued, only he told me then that he wasn't really a waiter at all. Maria's face froze a little, and she didn't say anything for a moment. Instead, she looked away and licked her lips a little before nodding her head. I see, she said. And what did he say he was, really? He said he was a doctor, said Bruno, which didn't seem right at all. He's not a doctor, is he? No, said Maria, shaking her head. No, he's not a doctor. He's a waiter. I knew it, said Bruno, feeling very pleased with himself. Why did he lie to me then? It doesn't make any sense. Pavel is not a doctor anymore, Bruno, said Maria quietly. But he was, in another life, before he came here. Bruno frowned and thought about it. I don't understand, he said. Few of us do, said Maria. But if he was a doctor, why isn't he one still? Maria sighed and looked out the window to make sure that no one was coming, then nodded towards the chairs, and both she and Bruno sat down. If I tell you what Pavel told me about his life, she said, you mustn't tell anyone, do you understand? We would all get in terrible trouble. I won't tell anyone, said Bruno who loved to hear secrets and almost never spread them around, except when it was totally necessary, of course, and there was nothing that he could do about it. 
All right, said Maria. This is as much as I know. Bruno was late arriving at the place in the fence where he met Schmull every day, but as usual, his new friend was sitting cross-legged on the ground waiting for him. Sorry I'm late, he said, handing some of the bread and cheese through the wire, the bits that he hadn't already eaten on the way when he had grown a little peckish after all. I was talking to Maria. Who's Maria? asked Schmull, not looking up as he gobbled down the food hungrily. She's our maid, explained Bruno. She's very nice, although father says she's overpaid. But she was telling me about this man, Pavel, who chops our vegetables for us and waits on table. I think he lives on your side of the fence. Schmoll looked up for a moment and stopped eating. On my side? he asked. Yes, do you know him? He's very old and has a white jacket that he wears when he's serving dinner. You've probably seen him. No, said Schmoll, shaking his head. I don't know him. But you must, said Bruno irritably, as if Schmoll were being deliberately difficult. He's not as tall as some adults, and he has gray hair and stoops over a little. I don't think you realize just how many people live on this side of the fence, said Schmoll. There are thousands of us. But this one's name is Pavel, insisted Bruno. When I fell off my swing, he cleaned out the cut so it didn't get infected and put a bandage on my leg. Anyway, the reason I wanted to tell you about him is that is because he is from Poland too, like you. Most of us here are from Poland, said Schmoll. Although there are some from other places too, like Czechoslovakia and... Yes, but that's why I thought you might know him. Anyway, he was a doctor in his hometown before he came here, but he's not allowed to be a doctor anymore. And if father had known that he had cleaned my knee when I hurt myself, then there would have been trouble. The soldiers don't normally like people getting better, said Schmoll, swallowing the last piece of bread. It usually works the other way around. Bruno nodded, even though he didn't quite know what Schmoll meant, and gazed up into the sky. After a few moments, he looked through the wire and asked another question that had been preying on his mind. Do you know what you want to be when you grow up? he asked. Yes, said Schmoll. I want to work in a zoo. A zoo? asked Bruno. I like animals, said Schmoll quietly. I'm going to be a soldier, said Bruno in a determined voice. Like father. I wouldn't like to be a soldier, said Schmoll. I don't mean one like Lieutenant Kotler, said Bruno quickly. Not one who strides around as if he owns the place, and laughs with your sister, and whispers with your mother. I don't think he's a good soldier at all. I mean one like father, one of the good soldiers. There aren't any good soldiers, said Schmoll. Of course there are, said Bruno. Who? Well, father for one, said Bruno. That's why he has such an impressive uniform, and why everyone calls him Commandant, and does whatever he says. The Fury has big things in mind for him because he's such a good soldier. There aren't any good soldiers, repeated Schmoll. Except father, repeated Bruno, who was hoping that Schmoll wouldn't say that again, because he didn't want to have to argue with him. After all, he was the only friend he had here at Outwith. But father was father and Bruno didn't think it was right for someone to say something bad about him. Both boys stayed very quiet for a few minutes, neither one wanting to say anything he might regret. You don't know what it's like here, said Schmoll eventually in a low voice, his words barely carrying across to Bruno. You don't have any sisters, do you? asked Bruno quickly, pretending that he hadn't heard that, because then he would have to answer. No said Schmoll, shaking his head. You're lucky, said Bruno. Gretel's only twelve, and she thinks she knows everything, but she's a hopeless case, really. She sits looking out of her window, and when she sees Lieutenant Kotler coming, she runs downstairs into the hallway and pretends that she was there all along. The other day I caught her doing it, and when he came in, she jumped and said, Why, Lieutenant Kotler, I didn't know you were here and I know for a fact that she was waiting for him. 
Bruno hadn't been looking at Schmull as he said all that, but when he looked again, he noticed that his friend had grown even more pale than usual. What's wrong? he asked. You look as if you're about to be sick. I don't like talking about him, said Schmull. About who? asked Bruno. Lieutenant Kotler. He scares me. He scares me a little too, admitted Bruno. He's a bully, and he smells funny. It's all that cologne he puts on. And then Schmull started to shiver slightly, and Bruno looked around as if he could see rather than feel whether it was cold or not. What's the matter? he asked. It's not that cold, is it? You should have brought a coat, you know. The evenings are getting chillier. Later that evening, Bruno was disappointed to find that Lieutenant Kotler was joining him, mother, father, and Gretel for dinner. Pavel was wearing his white jacket as usual and served them as they ate. Bruno watched Pavel as he went around the table and found that he felt sad whenever he looked at him. He wondered whether the white jacket he wore as a waiter was the same white jacket he had worn before as a doctor. As he brought the plates in and set them down in front of each of them, and while they ate their food and talked, he stepped back towards the wall and held himself perfectly still, neither looking ahead nor not. It was as if his body had gone to sleep standing up and with his eyes open. Whenever anyone needed anything, Pavel would bring it immediately. But the more Bruno watched him, the more he was sure the catastrophe was going to strike. He seemed to grow smaller and smaller each week, if such a thing were possible. And the color that should have been in his cheeks had drained almost entirely away. His eyes appeared heavy with tears, and Bruno thought that one good blink might bring on a torrent. When Pavel came in with the plates, Bruno couldn't help but notice that his hands were shaking, slightly under the weight of them. And when he stepped back to his usual position, he seemed to sway on his feet and had to press a hand against the wall to steady himself. Mother had to ask twice for her extra helping of soup before he heard her, and he let the bottle of wine empty without having opened another one in time to fill father's glass. Herr Litz won't let us read poetry or plays, complained Bruno during the main course. As they had company for dinner, the family were dressed formally, father in his uniform, mother in a green dress that set off her eyes, and Gretel and Bruno in the clothes that they wore to church when they lived in Berlin. I asked him if we could read them just one day a week, but he said no, not while he was in charge of our education. I'm sure he has his reasons, said father, attacking a leg of lamb. All he wants us to do is to study history and geography, said Bruno, and I'm starting to hate history and geography. Don't say hate, Bruno, please, said mother. Why do you hate history? asked father, laying down his fork for a moment and looking across the table at his son, who shrugged his shoulders, a bad habit of his. Because it's boring, he said. Boring, said father. A son of mine calling the study of history boring? Let me tell you this, Bruno, he went on, leaning forward and pointing his knife at the boy. It's history that got us here today. If it wasn't for history, none of us would be sitting around this table now. We'd be safely back at our table in our house in Berlin. We are correcting history here. It's still boring, repeated Bruno, who wasn't really paying attention. You'll have to forgive my brother, Lieutenant Kotler, said Gretel, laying a hand on his arm for a moment, which made Mother stare at her and narrow her eyes. He's a very ignorant little boy. I am not ignorant, snapped Bruno, who had had enough of her insults. You'll have to forgive my sister, Lieutenant Kotler, he added politely, but she's a hopeless case. There's very little that we can do for her. The doctors say she's gone past the point of help. Shut up, said Gretel, bl blushing scarlet. You shut up, said Bruno with a broad smile. Children, please, said Mother. Father tapped his knife on the table, and everyone went silent. Bruno glanced in his direction. He didn't look 
angry exactly, but he did look as if he wasn't going to put up with much more arguing. I enjoyed history very much when I was a boy, said Lieutenant Cotler, after a few silent moments. And although my father was a professor of literature at the university, I preferred the social sciences to the arts. I didn't know that, Kurt, said Mother, turning to look at him for a moment. Does he still teach, then? I suppose so, said Lieutenant Cotler. I don't really know. Well, how could you not know, she asked, frowning at him. Don't you keep in touch with him? The young lieutenant chewed on a mouthful of lamb, and it gave him an opportunity to think of a reply. He looked to Bruno as if he had regretted having brought up the matter in the first place. Kurt, repeated Mother, don't you keep in touch with your father? Not really, he replied, shrugging her shoulders dismissively and not turning his head to look at her. He left Germany some years ago, 1938, I think it was. I haven't seen him since then. Father stopped eating for a moment and stared across at Lieutenant Kotler, frowning slightly. And where did he go? he asked. I beg your pardon, Herr Commandant? asked Lieutenant Kotler, even though Father had spoken in a perfectly clear voice. I asked you where he went he repeated. Your father, the professor of literature, where did he go when he left Germany? Lieutenant Kotler's face grew a little red, and he stuttered somewhat as he spoke. I believe, I believe he is currently in Switzerland, he said finally. The last I heard, he was teaching at a university in Bern. Oh, but Switzerland's such a beautiful country, said Mother quickly. I haven't ever been there, I admit, but from what I hear, he can't be that old, dear father, said father, his deep voice silencing them all. I mean, you're only what, 17, 18 years old? I've just turned 19, Herr Commandant. So your father would be in his 40s, I would expect. Lieutenant Kotler said nothing, but continued to eat, although he didn't appear to be enjoying his food at all. Strange that he chose not to stay in the fatherland, said father. We're not close, my father and I, said Lieutenant Kotler quickly, looking around the table as if he owed everyone an explanation. Really, we haven't spoken in years. And what reason did he give, might I ask, continued father, for leaving Germany at the moment of her greatest glory and her most vital need, when it is incumbent upon all of us to play our part in the national revival? Was he tubercular? Lieutenant Cotler stared at Father, confused. I beg your pardon, he asked. Did he go to Switzerland to take the air, explained Father. Or did he have a particular reason for leaving Germany? In 1938, he added after a moment. I'm afraid I don't know, Herr Commandant, said Lieutenant Cotler. You would have to ask him. Well, that would be rather difficult to do, wouldn't it? With him being so far away, I mean. But perhaps that was it. Perhaps he was ill. Father hesitated before picking up his knife and fork again and continuing to eat. Or perhaps he had disagreements. Disagreements, Herr Commandant? With government policy. One hears tales of men like this from time to time. Curious fellows, I imagine. Disturbed, some of them. Traitors, others. Cowards, too. Of course, you have informed your superiors of your father's views, Lieutenant Kotler. The young lieutenant opened his mouth and then swallowed, despite the fact that he hadn't been eating anything. Never mind, said father cheerfully. Perhaps it is not an appropriate subject of conversation for the dinner table. We can discuss it more in depth at a later time. Herr Commandant, said Lieutenant Kotler, leaning forward anxiously. I can assure you, it is not an appropriate subject of conversation for the dinner table, repeated Father sharply, silencing him immediately. And Bruno looked from one to the other, 
both enjoying and being frightened by the atmosphere at the same time. I'd love to go to Switzerland, said Gretel after a lengthy silence. Eat your dinner, Gretel, said Mother. But I was just saying, eat your dinner, Mother repeated, and was about to say more, but she was interrupted by Father calling for Pavel again. What's the matter with you tonight? He asked as Pavel uncorked the new bottle. This is the fourth time I've had to ask for more wine. Bruno watched him, hoping he was feeling all right, although he managed to release the cork without any accidents. But after he had filled Father's glass and turned to refill Lieutenant Kotler's, he lost the grip of the bottle somehow, and it fell crashing, glug glug glugging its contents out directly onto the young man's lap. What happened then was both unexpected and extremely unpleasant. Lieutenant Kotler grew very angry with Pavel, and no one, not Bruno, not Gretel, not Mother, and not even Father, stepped in to stop him doing what he did next, even though none of them could watch, even though it made Bruno cry and Gretel grow pale. Later that night, when Bruno went to bed, he thought about all that had happened over dinner. He remembered how kind Pavel had been to him the afternoon he had made the swing, and how he had stopped his knee from bleeding, and been very gentle in the way he administered the green ointment. And while Bruno realized that Father was generally a very kind and thoughtful man, it hardly seemed fair or right that no one had stopped Lieutenant Kotler getting so angry at Pavel. If that was the kind of thing that went on at Outwith, then he'd better not dis disagree with anyone anymore about anything. In fact, he would do well to keep his mouth shut and cause no chaos at all. Some people might not like it. His old life in Berlin seemed like a very distant memory now, and he could hardly even remember what Carl, Daniel, or Martin looked like, except for the fact that one of them was a ginger.